about the hope for tonight's event. And as you've already heard, this is our first Hacker event. Uh, but we hope it won't be our last. And it's also um, our second meetup because we also mentioned we've started doing the Drupal meetup now as well. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. I think I've told most people the toilet's just in there, the kitchen's in there. Um, and I'm hoping, I forgot to mention it's going to all arrive, but no one parked in the clearways or anything, hopefully. Um, and on to our main speaker. So you've all just met Sanvi. Oh, might need yeah. to pronounce it. Uh, Sambapathy. Uh, uh, Alphabet soup, sorry. <laughs> um, so he's a sales engineer at Confluent with a background in DevOps and automation. Um, and I'll let him tell you a bit more about his background. And also his um, topic tonight is microservice architectures. But again, I'll let him um, take you through that. Thank you. Um, so thank you to Salsa for hosting us, first of all. Hopefully it's the not the last. Confluent slash Kafka uh, event we have here. Um, I did bring some merch, uh, so help yourself. There's stickers, pens, t-shirts, uh, and other stuff. Um, help yourself as we're talking. There's not enough, uh, let's treat this like really, really informally so that don't attach any formality to what I'm doing. And I was serious when I said there was 75 slides, so you'll find me jumping back and forth a bit um, there's a couple of reasons I'm doing this. Um, the, the volume of the slides, uh, basically a context. So I don't know if you guys have uh, au fait with what happened at uh, Kafka Summit in October. Um, there was a whole bunch of announcements about KSQL DB. Um, to context set, I think we'll start with what Kafka was in the past before that, and then we'll talk about microservices and what KSQL DB is and what it's going towards. Um, it's very much in its infancy. Um, I might shorten the conversation and then we can have a Q&A session because um, there's enough of us to kind of engage in the conversation. And at the moment, you know, just to give me an idea, how many of you like have been using Kafka for more than a year? More than two years? Three? Okay. Well, this is the thing. Um, it's symptomatic of, of typically Australian adoption of technology. Um, we tend to... I don't want to say laggards, but we tend to be laggards. But then we adopt at such a, a rate that we tend to overtake some of the other countries. Um, you'll find like Japan tend to be early adopters, but really slow, like getting up the maturity curve. Um, it was the same. My, my background is automation. I'll go through that in a second. But I think there's some interesting um, things in the ecosystem around Kafka, not just the tech, but you know things where it's headed. So we'll start with what are microservices. How many of you guys are using microservices at the moment? Right, so we'll, we'll touch on microservices. Um, we'll talk about the current thinking about microservices. We'll talk about databases and microservices because they're useless without them. Uh, events, uh, some basics of Kafka. Um, and then we'll talk about designing uh, basically you know, for event first. So my background, um, I actually started as a SQL Server developer. I don't know how many of you remember Curses, but oh my god, that was a painful existence. Um, learning about dirty reads, dirty writes, Curses, DTS, data transformation services, so like integration, the worst kind of integration. Then I was like a glutton for punishment and I became a J2EE developer. Did single sign-on stuff for like five years, six years, so security, data integration. Then I started managing the Unix team at RMIT University. Just started using Puppet, DevOps, Ansible. Um, my team of five people managed like a thousand servers. We're talking about you know enterprise stuff like SAP, PeopleSoft, um, AWS, uh, Results Online, that sort of stuff. Um, I made the jump to uh, Confluent, Kafka. Um, I'm now a whole lot happier than I used to be. <laughs> so we'll start with um, context setting. In the old days, we used to use monoliths. Um, monoliths are, are generally viewed as bad. I mean, there are good architectural design patterns for monoliths at the time when monoliths were a thing. Uh, but these days, they're frowned upon. I think, historically, they become these really large beasts of burden where everything kind of goes to, to rest. Like, if you think of it like a, a giant tar pit where every dinosaur decides to traipse through and get stuck, um, that's kind of like how people treat monoliths. Oh, there's, there's you know, availability on this machine, it has some resources, let's throw something else on it. Um, and I think historically that's, that's the reason things kind of suck on like large pieces of infrastructure, because people have a propensity just to dump stuff. 
on there, and this goes to kind of the next point as well. They, they're hard to think about, not because you can have a single application on them, it's because people put more than a single application on them. Um, but this is true. The next point is, is always true. They're hard to change. Um, it's because, you know, monoliths are traditionally large pieces of infrastructure that are attached to hardware. They're not what we understand today as a, as a service. Technology has come a long way. Like, you know, I was alive at the time that there was like no, no source control and that was like not, not a time to be living. Uh, so look, um, maybe it's the way we look at things. Like if you think about the, the giant loaf of bread as opposed to small, small loaves of bread, what you have there, the intention is to, to kind of give you this message, is a, a unit of work that's small that you know how to roll out again and again and again. And I think that's the idea of a microservice. Like as factory-like as that sounds, the adoption of that methodology is kind of what bleeds itself into things like agile. You know, short sprints, you know how to do something, you come back and you check. Because the longer something that takes to build, like in terms of project management and technology, the harder it is to kind of meter yourself and have stop, stop gates. And basically, you know, a feedback loop that says, hey, this thing's taking too long, we should get rid of it. Um, so I think the, the propensity to move to, you know, simpler architecture is just like human nature. Um, Expected to evolve as well going forward. So basically, we we break a perfectly good application into these little little pieces, and then you find yourself in the ironic situation where you have to reintegrate all these other little bits, you know, to turn these small little applications into a business function, right? So inherently, that's that's a microservice. Some people may get upset at the next slide. <clears throat> there really isn't a good way to integrate microservices, right? Because there are system boundaries, there are domain boundaries. <laughs> um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that just breaks the whole simple design pattern. I mean, think about it like this. If you're a developer and you're writing a piece of code that says, I want to go and update my cart, you know, blah, blah, blah. Your concern for that sprint should be the cart, but well, I guarantee you when you're actually doing business logic for the cart, you're gonna do things like go and check inventory, go and check stock, fire off other stuff. It's, you know, despite the fact that you're building microservice, you're really not. And just in case you, you missed the first point, um, there's no good way to integrate microservices. Um, traditionally, but you guys uh, have heard of ETL, batch files. So file system integration, let me write it to a file, let me read it later on. <laughs> That's like the most base form of, of microservice integration. Um, if you're doing this today, you probably shouldn't be. Um, yeah, come and talk to me after maybe. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's, that's a really old but simple way to look at it. So database integration is, is what we see now, right? So everything talks to the same database or a copy of a database that's a copy of another database, et cetera. Um, this is, like we say, tried and true. Um, it is what it is. It's the best thing we have at the moment. You know, deal with it. Um, so let me just jump a couple of slides because this is one of my favorite things. I've got a database and I know how to use it. The first person who says that probably doesn't know how to use it. Um, if you think about a da database, it's, so I'll throw a question out there. Who knows what like the main fault of a database is when you do, when you go and get data from something? Oh, you can guess there's no answer, wrong answer. I mean, it, what's, what's wrong with a database in terms of the data that's available to you when you go and get it at any given time? Hmm. There's no context. There, there is absolutely no context about how that data got in there. It's not a log, it's a materialized view of what is true at the time, right? There's absolutely no business context to that, to that piece of data. And a lot of people are beginning to care about that more and more. So if you think, think about it like this. If I'm a shopper at Target, I go into the app, I attach five or six t-shirts to my, to my cart, I don't check out. In terms of a database event, nothing's really happened because I haven't checked anything out. I've just added stuff to my cart. I haven't manipulated anything. 
data is data, right? There's no, there's no context. But think about this. The business has just lost five t-shirts, right? Where is that captured? The answer is it's not, and it never will be. Um, and that's part of the problem, like when you think about eventing. We'll go into eventing you know, in a bit, but a database doesn't really have that. And it, it's not built to have that, right? If you think about the, the database as a, a service or as a gear or a cog, it was built to capture data as it is, like post-event, not pre-event. It, it has like no real context. It's so rigid, yeah. But yeah, anybody says that they know how to use the database is probably a liar. Um, so I've just explained to you like commingling of services, um, violations of bounded context in, in the card example. Because if a database has only one view and is only cognizant at any given time of one bit of data, you're ultimately going to be subject to that limitation, right? And it, when you're writing apps, a lot of developers don't really think about business context or value proposition of context. They care about solving the problem real quick. And I think that's a mindset that needs to change. Uh, look, I won't bother going through remote procedure calls, but I will share this with you. Um, so RPCs um, are basically a bolt-on to a database to give you context. So if you think, you know, think of like an inner join between three or four different systems, which is basically an API call, right? So you've got a piece of data that you believe you're authoritative for, but you want context about that data, so you'll go and ask API X, Y, and Z about it. The problem is the API is also looking at a database, and it's giving you what they think is context. Um, RPC is request response. Kind of not really how eventing works. Event is event, and no, you know, no request preceding that event. The event isn't the event. So, you know, if you want to debug all these systems, particularly RPC, how do you do it? You build the log that you can go and ask questions of any time. And this is how like events came about. So, you know, an event is an immutable event. Sorry, an immutable thing that happens that may or may not belong in a data store. But when I've clicked on a page, if you think of it about an Apache access log, if I've clicked on a page, that's an event. It's kept it, right? Irrespective of, of what's happened. If I go and do a checkout, it knows about that. Um, if I hover over an image, JavaScript knows about that. If I grab a page in context, you know, the context of the page and the image load is known, that sort of stuff. So that's kind of how you can think of an event. Um, what's interesting is this year, CNCF um, is, a, is a real entity, like uh, you guys know about HTTP, being an RFC. CNCF is the Cloud Native Computing uh, Foundation. They're releasing a framework called the Eventing Framework, which is basically an RFC. Um, that meets these definitions. I won't read it all to you. Um, you're going to get very bored. I am, however, going to grab a seat. <laughs> um, basically, it's about democratizing events, making them available to everybody who cares about them, um, but giving some structure to that event. Things like, you know, ID, source, um, a whole bunch of other stuff, like payload. Uh, I would really suggest, like, if you have the time, and it won't take long, 10, 15 minutes, just go and have a quick look at, at cloud events. Um, it is going to be like the next best thing, uh, the next big thing. So when you say CNCF, uh, just about cloud events, or they're more broad, like that they have a... No, so uh, CNCF are actually like a, a body that released the RFC on cloud events. So they care, uh, they care about more than cloud events, but like being, you know... Yeah. Yeah. Um, but CNCF do a lot of good work. The, the other really cool thing about this is they have a meeting every Thursday. You can just show up and you can table your ideas. Um, and the Zoom is publicly available. Um, Robin Moffat, a couple of our, our guys, I believe, are on this board. But one of the guys that was um, presenting at Kafka Summit gave a really, really 
interesting talk about the value of having a unified specification for an event. Um, it's kind of like having a manufacturing standard for cars, right? Like you kind of know if you put it into drive, this is going to happen. Um, at the moment, there is no real formal um, identity to, for an event. An event is basically how you make it. Um, are you guys aware of how Kafka works? All right, cool. M maybe what I'll do is we'll run through Kafka next, and then we'll talk about producers, consumers, and we'll come back to events. But eventing is, I believe, um, one of the things on our forefront that more and more organizations will be adopting. Right, um, so you know, just to kind of reiterate the point, this is more about context and evolution over time. That's why you should care about events. We've covered that. Um, so let's go into Kafka Basics. Um, I'll run through this, and then I'll run through maybe a microservices architecture and how it looks like with eventing and without eventing. Um, but first, we'll run through this. So Kafka uh, Confluent, the event streaming platform, is actually many different things. Um, there's three things that underlie Kafka. At its core, it's a continuous commit log. To the left of that, you have something that's called the Connect Framework. And to the right of that, you have something that's called uh, streams, Kafka streams. Um, each of those are basically you know, storage, pub sub, publish, subscribe at scale, and processing, as in processing the event as it happens. So you can do something with it like, all right, here's a very simple example. A um, couple of customers of a, a, uh, an organization that, let's say, does gambling have apps that basically are contextually driven for streaming. And I'll go into the business why, uh, reasons why. You could be in a field at, let's say, Flemington. You could have a bad day at the races. So that's like you have three bad bets. You've lost X amount of money in X amount of time. Um, you know, most punters these days, if you look at their behavior, if you have a, a bad experience in an app, you just move to another app because it's really easy. Um, the idea is that you're sticky to a, or loyal to a, a particular provider of the gambling service. So if you have, you know, three bad bets, particular track, particular day, you'll get an offer pop up immediately. And that's like stream processing. Contextual events, you've had, you know, three bad events, it's done the aggregate, or I've lost this much money in this much time, I'm in this location, you need to give this person like a deal so that they don't shuffle off and find somewhere else to bet. Um, so that's like the processing app aspect. So core abstraction, we'll go through that in a minute. Um, Kafka is basically a giant log. Um, the log itself is a really, really, really simple idea. Uh, messages are added at the end of the log here, can you see my, you can see my mouse, but it's tiny. Um, here, uh, this is the history of the message. So at any given time, you can cycle through, through the events. The best part about this is multiple people or multiple sources of data can write to the same log. Conversely, the people that consume this log data can read from different places. So think about it like this. Uh, I'll give you a simple database uh, analogy. People in the past used to hydrate test data uh, from production data by restoring a backup. Imagine for a second you can point your database to two weeks in the past automatically and have that delta automatically managed because what you're doing is you're consuming from a point that's two weeks in the past as opposed to current. So this, it's a little bit of a different way of thinking. Um, it's called consumer offset. Basically, what happens is you choose from which you, you where you ingest your data. <clears throat> Just to complicate things a little bit, each of these data streams is a unique stream within the data pipeline. So these are called topics. You can have 30 of these. A topic might be user ID. Uh, a topic might be user purchases. A topic may be user streams. Um, topics don't care who's reading them, um, and they don't care where you're reading them from. That's all taken care of by the, the distributed computing aspect of, of Kafka. Don't care about the scaling. Pretend it's, it's not your problem, because it isn't. This thing's built to scale. 
you know, producers and consumers can do their own thing. Inherently what you need to understand about this is you're not bogged down on the point of this data lives here, I have to go and retrieve it and you know, bring it back here. What happens is the broker goes and gets the data for whoever cares about data at point X, Y, and Z. And that's part of the, the, the appeal of Kafka. Remember though, access is only sequential, right? So you read to an offset and you scan. And to my point, natively Kafka is built for distributed computing. So you have consumers, you have producers. Um, the distributed consuming aspect basically means many brokers, many topics, many sh pieces of sharded data, no bottleneck. Now, we talked about Kafka Connect before. Um, to the left and to the uh, of Kafka sits this Connect API. Basically what happens is um, there are two things, a data source and a data sync. Uh, imagine Salesforce for a second and you want to get data out of Salesforce and into Kafka. That's called the source. If you want to get data from Kafka into uh, Salesforce, that's called the sync. Um, basically the commit log itself is getting data via its connectors, which is the Connect API. And that's kind of what it looks like. So I'm sourcing data from Blue. Connect Framework is doing it. Think of it as a just very fancy Java API, putting that into Kafka, which is the long commit log of, of events. And then Kafka Connect says, OK, I, I need to ship this to another external data source for analytics, let's say you know, Elk, uh, Elastic, or whatever it is you're using. Um, it'll dump it there. To the right of this is a stream processing engine. The event I gave you before about people losing money, et cetera, that's a stream process. It's aware of you know, artifacts that have happened within a time window. Um, on top of that, something called KSQL sits. Um, it is an engine for computation, basically like written to look like SQL, but it's not really. Um, it's basically a Java file. Um, that's what it looks like on top. That's kind of what it looks like underneath. It's just a simplified library to, to help you manipulate streams in flight. So now you've got kind of an idea of, of what Kafka is, like those three, three boxes. Um, maybe next time I'll do a, a full deeper dive, but this is intended to be very light. So in terms of microservices, we can do, you know, pretty much anything a data store can do, but plus, right? So if you think about the, the example I gave you before about the abandoned cart, a database will never give you that. A microservice may be able to, but contextually, um, in terms of you know, getting a microservice to understand context, store, previous state, that's a, a very hard problem for a developer to solve. Whereas with uh, Kafka, the event of leaving the cart itself can be embedded into a business context event saying, customer's just left five things in his cart and he's logged off. You may want to address this. Um, the other thing is, you know, a lot of uh, companies don't address it immediately. And I'll, actually, let me, let me give you a real, really good example. Uh, window. Right. Ignore the fact that it says roadmap. Right. So this is like a really, really smart abandoned car from Uber. I fly to New Zealand pretty regularly, like once, once a month, let's say, uh, most frequently. Um, I never take an Uber from the airport to go to my hotel, ever. Um, I basically just jump into a taxi because they're right there outside. It's a little bit more expensive, but whatever. Last week, um, I came back to New Zealand airport, Auckland airport, uh, via Uber. As I sit down, I get a notification from my phone that says, here's 20% off your next airport trip from New Zealand, as in only from the airport to your hotel. So not only have they realized, A, I'm not using their service, they've identified missed business op opportunity that they didn't know that they were missing before, and C, their you know, rewards team have just jumped onto an op for like pretty much minimal effort they've given somebody the ability to cannibalize somebody else's business. Now, every business who does this will eventually end up beating their competition. But this is fiendishly clever, like unbelievably fiendish. 
but I thought it was really good. Like when I sat down, I'm like, that's, yeah, that's pretty clever. So that's a case of like analytics based on my two previous trips, context, and reacting to the current event, which is me getting out of the Uber at the airport to kind of confirm their suspicion. Um, but yeah, I thought, I thought that was like a pretty powerful use case. Like so good that I thought I'd make a slide out of it. Um, so let's go back to microservices. So, you know, traditionally microservices look like this. Um, UI, web server, the order service, the fulfillment service. And at their core, <clears throat> this is the, the shared responsibility I was talking about that sits inside the database. When, where you're a developer, you code business logic for other departments that you really don't care about, or that's not really your problem. Um, most services live in this little gray area where you have to care about other business logic, right? Um, not really optimal. The problem is that data doesn't really break down um, into boundaries like the way we want. So when you have like a, I want to shop this, it's not just let me just buy, it's let me buy this, let me add it to a checkout, let me add it to a you know, delivery service, let me go and withdraw that amount from you know, warehouse or central you know, warehousing, whatever. There's no real isolation, despite the fact that people tell you I've built this thing for isolation. Um, data boundaries are very tough to, 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 fix, to fix. This is where Kafka is very, very different because the data boundary is basically a plane that's shared by everything. So what happens is when you write an event that says I'm buying five or six different, you know, t-shirts of size X, Y, and Z, you put this into the data plane, right? And the thing that responds to it is not you, but it's what cares about that, that item. So the other piece of information that's subscribing to that, that change of event is what will do the work for everybody else. Um, and this is all kept into a continuous commit log. If this event needs to be massaged into, like, into any other form of data, you can do that with streams. So inherently, there's two types of events, notification and, rep and replication. Notification of something's happened or replication of something that's, that's data. Um, if you think about microservices with RPC, you get all this stuff like talking to each other. <clears throat> so yeah, sad, no Kafka. Oops, let me go back. So if you're actually going to refactor it, what happens is your web server, you actually have real decoupling. Your order service publishes to Kafka. Your shipping service will actually read from events that are published. Customer service can subscribe to both or none of these events. They're, they're really fire and forget. So in terms of development and agile, it becomes a thing of, hey, I've written it, off you go. So I'll actually skip this slide. And this one. So this is the other thing that I kind of wanted to bring up. You're kind of getting the decoupling ideology. I won't go too heavy into it, but there is something else I wanted to really bring up. When you're actually sending event data into the, the data pipeline. Validation is something you need to care about a lot of the time. Um, schema management basically dictates how you validate that data coming in and coming out, because this is a problem that you need to be able to, to solve when everything's eating from the one pipe. Um, so there's something called schema registry that ships with Kafka that does this. Um, so if you're going to be writing microservices, schema registry is absolutely your friend. Um, the streams API is also um, your friend. Now we mentioned KSQL a little bit. Um, I might come back and do a deeper presentation on SQL, but the materialized view of the data that we were talking about that exists in the database exists inside of Kafka. Kafka. You can create a KSQL table that you can do selects from for contextualized, non-contextualized view of data at any given time. Um, so that problem you know, is solved as well, but typically you'll find yourself you know, subscribing to events more than you know, getting stuff from a, a materialized view. So you know, in kind of refactoring and redesigning the, 
the application, um, what happens is you have things consuming straight from the pipe. Um, you have transactional guarantees. You have data management. Um, you, you want these services also to be like transactional, like the, the normal database transactional um, meaning of that word. Um, within the services, there are transactions. Outside of the services, like between them, it's not really a transaction. Um, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around it, but think about it like this. Uh, when a service does something in, in its isolation, that's a transaction in terms of a context of an event. Um, validate, checking, blah, 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 across three is three different service calls outside of three diff different transactions in this instance. Um, it sounds horrible, but it's actually easy once you wrap your head around it. Um, and the other really good thing is the event log is immutable, so you have complete context as to what happened within that chain of events. So, you know, hydrating materialized views, same sort of thing. Um, pretty much easy to do within uh, Confluent and Kafka. So what does this look like once we've like decoupled everything? So Kafka is actually, again, your data backbone, your fraud service, um, your order service, your order validation, all feed data into here. And whenever I need data to be passed between services, they go into the stream rather than talk to each other. And that really means like tightly, de oh, I was going to say tightly coupled, but that's the exact opposite, um, real decoupling. Um, if you want to find examples of this, this is like peeling back the onion. I know it's a terrible thing. I couldn't find like peeling onions. Um, what's the purpose of a database in context to this? What's the purpose of SQL in context to this? What does the tabular model mean? Like think about what we've just done. You don't need to care about indexes. You don't need to care, well, you kind of need to care about schemas. Um, you don't need to care about how you retrieve data. All you're doing is pushing events into a stream. It's completely abstracted to you what the database is, what performance is, you know, just out of curiosity, when was the last time you guys wrote a stored procedure? Any of you? Or a function in database? Not ages ago? So you guys remember those days when people used to have to do that for performance reasons? Um, these days, like MongoDB, like NoSQL is, is still a thing, like, but you still need to be aware of like relational models to some degree. In this instance, you don't. The schema will enforce your conversation with everybody else. You just need to adhere to the schema, which is a standard. It's like when everybody speaks English, there are general words that everybody understands. That's like the schema. Um, I don't really care how you store your information and you shouldn't care how I store mine. And that's what makes the tabular model unique. Um, Kafka is a big giant storage engine, big giant commit log. Um, so finally, you know, when you're writing microservices, think about abstraction of data in true sense of the word. Um, the point of today wasn't really to kind of talk to the future of microservices, but how you should be writing microservices for an event-driven world. So I guess the title was a bit of a misleading title, but it's okay. Well, I can fix it next time. Um, so just remember, you're never writing just microservices if you're using eventing. You're actually writing like an inside out database because you're publishing data, but not really. Um, and that's like a really good thing because I think, you know, this is the future more or less um, because you get all the benefits of microservices, small apps that are really not tightly coupled to anything. And despite the fact that people say, hey, my microservices are not coupled, well, it kind of is because you're using a data model that everybody else is, is forcing you to adhere to. Um, so if you're curious, go and have a look at, at Conway's law, um, and you kind of understand the benefits of a, a streaming platform. But I believe I've talked your ears off. Um, that's my uh, email address if you've got questions. Uh, we run meetups fairly often uh, in Melbourne. We'll definitely be back at Salsa. So thank you again for hosting us. That was really good. Um, this blogs. Um, we also have a Slack channel. Um, if you're interested, we have a lot of material where you can learn stuff.
just for free. Um, the KSQL stuff is now out, I believe. Um, just go and grab it. Oh, thank you for your uh, attention. Free swag on the table. Take it, seriously. Thank you. Uh, we can go through questions if you like. Probably a good time to stop recording, I would say.